Queen Mug panel discussion with junior black women lawyers. We have a discussion with up and coming lawyers in the profession, all at various stages in their junior careers. And we are going to discuss their journeys to the law and also what they have learned, what they've experienced and what they would tell their past self. And my name is Kito Oshasani. I am a member of the Wickle Race Equalities Committee and a future pupil barrister at Red Lion Chambers. Hi, I'm Lady Jeannie Vaskovitz. I'm a third six pupil barrister at 25 Bedford Row, where we exclusively defend. Uh, I'm currently most in the magistrate's court. I've done a bit of youth court work and soon I'll add a busy, busy crown court practice, I hope. <laughs> and uh, I'm Letitia Duffus. I work as a solicitor advocate at Shaw Graham Kirsch Solicitors. We specialise in criminal defence, so that's all we do. And it's kind of the best of both worlds because I do advocacy, I do representing people from police stations all the way up to Crown Court. So. Hi, my name is Bianca. I'm a solicitor. I'm employed by Hodge Jones and Allen Solicitors. I work in the crime department and uh, specialise in uh, representing individuals charged with criminal offences or alleged to have committed criminal offences. I My practice is focused on, on um, representing young people in the youth court. I do magistrate's court work and I also litigate on Crown Court work. Amazing, thank you. Hi, um, I'm Aaliyah Adams. I'm a trainee solicitor at the Crown Prosecution Service and I'm due to qualify in exactly a month, Ooh, so not long to right. go at all. Hi, I'm Vida Simpe. I'm a barrister at 25 Bedford Row. Um, so I've been in chambers about three years now, um, and I only do criminal defence, just like Lady and you, <laughs> Great, so we've got a mixture of barristers and solicitors and solicitor advocates doing prosecution and defence. So first of all, Lady Jemaine, how did you come to where you are now ultimately? Tell us a bit about your journey. It was a bit confused and confusing. So it started when I was still in high school in Namibia, where I'm from, and I really wanted to get into human rights law. That was what I really wanted to do. And then it sort of started this journey of a million insane internships um, that started in Namibia. But then I came to the UK to study law. I wanted to do law with international relations, which I thought was really interesting. So I did my undergrad here and then I went to Amsterdam to do a master's in international criminal law, um, which was really nice because I got the criminal law experience. I got a little bit of human rights law experience, which is amazing. And then more unpaid internships, which was really difficult because I was obviously working nine to five in the office, but then I had to waitress in the evening to make sure I could pay my bills and eat. Uh, so I did that for about two years, I think it was in total. And then I got an intern, uh, sorry, I got a scholarship from Lincoln's Inn to fund the bar course, which was really amazing. And that was the same year I actually was able to do an internship in Cambodia at the ECCC. So they were dealing with war crimes and genocide all arising out of the Khmer Rouge and so on. And that was also the same year that, oh no, it wasn't, sorry. I then started the BPTC and it was that year that I got pupillage at 25 Bedford Row. So all in all, I think from starting my undergrad in 2011 until getting pupillage in 2018, it was a long year. Uh, a long couple of years um, but yeah I've done my pupillage I'm still it, well it's a bit weird to say I think because I finished 12 months pupillage so according to the bar standards board I am a barrister um, but I'm in my third six at 25 Bedford Row so it's 18 months uh, at the end of which I hope I'll get tenancy <laughs> so that's that's where I'm at now yeah. amazing thank you so much yeah. so my journey began in the north of England because I'm from Sheffield originally and um, after my law, well, I did a law and criminology degree, um, I had a bit of, couldn't decide whether I wanted to do the solicitor route or the barrister route, mm -hmm. but like Lady Jeanie, I got a scholarship from Middle Temple and I ended up doing the bar course, um, fully paid for. So I was like, yes, this is a good start. <laughs> um, not gonna get myself into debt or anything like that. And then um, I wanted to stay sort of north um, but was in Sheffield at that time. When I did my um, bar course, it was the bar course then, back in 2005, there literally was, I think, three sets of chambers in Sheffield. Um, so options were limited. So I got a job in a criminal law firm, mm. um, was working there for a good few years, did my police station accreditation and thought, actually, 
at that time, it, the whole solicitor advocate thing was quite new. Um, I thought that might be a route for me. So I managed to qualify, um, cross-qualify on the QLTT, um, became a solicitor and then got my higher rights as an advocate that way and have been, had moved to London in 2014 and have been working down here ever since really in the mean sort of a bit like it wasn't a straight journey mm -hmm. um in the meantime i did do a, a master's myself in um international human rights law and practice so a little bit like yourself lady jane um and it didn't it wasn't really for me the whole human rights practice i did like six months working in judicial review stuff but came back to criminal law because i guess it's got that thing once you find it and you do it it kind of keeps pulling you back um so yeah so it's been it's been good I mean I've I'd say you know it's been a long road but it's been a worthwhile road for me because I can't really think of what else I would do if I wasn't doing this amazing thank you so much Bianca let's hear from you okay so my journey into the legal profession um I actually returned to university as a mature student whilst I was on maternity leave from working as a civil servant so I completed my LLB degree at the University of Westminster after completing that I went straight on to conduct um well complete my LPC course once I completed my LP course LPC course, I've done some voluntary work with the Citizen Advice Bureau um, and the Law Centre and various other charities. And then i done some paralegal work for a firm in South London before I began to um, do some paralegal work at Hodgstones and Ellen. And then they offered me my training contract and here I am today, fully qualified as a solicitor. It has been <laughs> it has been a long road but a good long road <laughs> yeah amazing thank you so much it's really interesting to hear that you're coming into the law as a second profession um other than coming straight into it coming out of school um what have you found interesting about that um well it it, it opens you up to exposes you more to a different variety of skill set i think from what you learn from university and then applying it into uh, the practice area um yeah it's just given me a broader skill set as to what i had before from my previous job amazing thank you in terms of my journey um i actually sort of wanted to be a barrister since i was like 15. um i so i originally came from ghana um so went through a plethora of different things I wanted to be sort of oh I want to be a hairdresser I want to be a dancer I want to be this I think you're like um, that's the same as me yeah <laughs> and, then, um, and then I think I went to I think one summer my friends and I, um, after going to like on a school trip to Wood Green Crown Court my friends and I the nerds that we were um decided to spend our summer sort of just watching cases in Wood Green Crown Court because we realized that we could um and so from there I thought that looks really cool I want to do that um, so that was sort of the start of that journey, um, but I think it was a very, it was a long road because um, sort of a lots of twists and turns. I did, um, par I did paralegal work, mm. um, not actually doing crime at all, um, did education and community care as well as public law. Um, then after that, I then actually got pupillage in a solicitor's firm um, because there was an in-house barrister trained with him doing education and crime and then got a third six pupillage at 25 Bedford Row, did my third six pupillage, got taken on as the tenant, yay. Um, and then that's it. <laughs> I'm here now, I made it. You said that you were tra when you were training doing your pupillage with, in the solicitor's firm, you did a bit of education and crime. Was it always your intention to go solely into crime or were you still open to other things as well? Well, I think for me, it was, I, I always wanted to do crime, but then 
as I sort of started my journey, I got to experience lots of different areas of law, which has actually helped my practice a lot. Mm. So with education law, it was mainly to do with special educational needs um, and sort of supporting young people who have been permanently excluded from school. Yeah. And the reason why I say it, it helps with my practice as a criminal practitioner is because a lot of the time when you meet a young person, the way this, they speak or the way they present themselves, you start to think, well, hold on, there's more to this than just a, a young person who's misbehaving. Mm. And so it broadens having that additional experience sort of broadens my my mind in terms of how I approach clients and how I think of cases. And so even though I'm interested in different areas of law, those skill sets that I gained from that area has actually benefited me quite a lot in my criminal practice. A little bit about my career journey. I went to the University of Birmingham. I graduated in 2017. I then went straight on to do the LPC at the University of Law and then I was really fortunate that I actually got my training contract the same year. So I finished my LPC in June and started my training contract with the CPS in November. But I think what it came down to was that I'd figured out what I wanted to do and that was just really important for me, for me in terms of focusing my efforts. But don't get me wrong, I hadn't always known what I wanted to do and in fact in my second year of university I was really doubting whether law was actually for me at all because I found that all the university's resources was targeted towards corporate commercial law and that's just really not what I wanted to do so it, it made me think this isn't for me. But thankfully the CPS came um, to do an event at the university and it just it opened my eyes to a career I could see myself doing so from that very moment I started seeking out opportunities experiences building my CV to show that I was passionate about criminal law so that I'd then be able to use those examples in my training contract application. And so the next question was, what has your experience been as a black woman working within criminal law? Shall I start with that one? Yes, please. Yeah. I was thinking about this question for a really long time. And I think in my work so far, my being a woman and my being a black hasn't, being black hasn't featured that much. I notice it when I go to the youth court, if ever, because um, I do have the feeling that my youth clients, especially obviously when they're black kids, they do approach me differently. I did have it, like sometimes you just know that they're comfortable with you because you're black. I had it one time that a client said, are you my barrister? And I said, yes, oh, thank God you're black. Yes. So that's like one of those rare occasions. <laughs> yeah. Out loud. Um, but you do notice that sort of like when I present myself to clients for the first time when they're black themselves, they do seem a bit more at ease, like put at ease. And I've noticed that the way that they speak with me is not the way that they speak with non-black people. Um, so they're they're just obviously more comfortable. And I do put it down to the color of my skin. Mm. Um, those have been the extremely positive sides. I think a bit of the negative has been not necessarily in practice, but getting here has been incredibly difficult. Um, and the one thing that stood out to me more than anything else was when you're like at networking events or maybe in mini pupillage or something like this, and you get that surprise. Oh, you've got a master's degree. Oh, you're this. And I, I, I hate that so much. That's one thing that put me off. So it wasn't necessarily negativity to my face, mm. but the surprise does show an assumption that you weren't going to be here, that you are not intended to be here, that you're not, you know, you, the system wasn't built for you to actually have made it here as a young black immigrant woman. And so that's a bit, that's a bit of the negative. But overall, I think like ever since I've been in practice, me being a young black woman has, in my opinion, been an asset more than anything else. Mm. Yeah. So. And I think it's really interesting that you mentioned about how clients feel comfortable with you because you are black, you know, you're similar mm. background to them. And mm. it's something that even I've experienced, you know, when I was a paralegal, I used to work in prison law. And there was one client, um, so I'm Nigerian, he was from Sierra Leone, and yeah. he would always talk to me in pigeon because he didn't want the prison guards to understand what he was saying. And so pigeon yeah. is a sort of dialect which is used across West Africa, which is... Yeah. It's like a cross between English and other languages as well, but it's something that we can all understand no matter whereabouts you are from in in West Africa or different countries. Mm -hmm. And so, like you said, that's something to 
pick up on to to relate to clients that can help with with the service that you provide to them thank you for sharing uh letitia um so i think i think the best experience that i've had so far is being able to give back because i person i personally know how hard it is to sort of get your foot in the door and to start on this career path so Mm -hmm. one of the things that i have tried to do is offer work experience to young people especially um young black boys or young black girls anyone who's interested that comes from a background that is you just recognize is going to be difficult for them to sort of get one the work experience and two um just get the information because i think when i started out one of the things that i really found difficult was just understanding the process of how this whole legal field works like when you go for when you're doing your um b uh bar vocational case or bpttc or whatever it's called these days (laughs) um, (laughs) one of the things that i found just like mind baffling was the fact that i had to go and have like 12 dinner sessions Mm -hmm. down in middle temple and (laughs) like that to me was quite intimidating like going down there like meeting new people and not knowing like, you know, what people are like, you drink out of that glass, you use those forks and all that sort of stuff. You need to know just the little things can throw you off. Yeah. So like one of, the, one of the recent things that I did, because I, I um, go out to um, uh, pupil referral units and we do workshops and we do role plays on like criminal stuff. Um, and one of the boys who, who was 15 at the time said, um, I want to do what you're doing. And I was like, really? Do you really? And I was like, well, when you're 16, if you send me your CV, I'll give you work experience. And I thought, okay, let, let's see if he does. And honestly, the boy sent me, it must have been his 16th birthday or whatever, just shortly oh, after. Yeah, sent me his CV and I was like, you know what? I will give you work experience. <laughs> he came, we'd, like, we, we went all over to different... Um, like courts and stuff and it was really funny because um he saw a black guy working in the court and he was like he was like they got they got black people like black guy black guys working and i was like yeah there are a few you know like and i think it sort of made him feel like you know what i could do this like i can do this i can see people who look like me who are doing it like if i work hard i can get there exactly. and it's just yeah it's just trying to give that experience and give that outlook to say you know what there might be barriers in place but people are getting there and if you want to get there you can get there exactly and that's why representation is so important and being accessible so i mean you being in in the in the pupil referral unit with him if you had never been there he may never have known about the law or what could have been and he never had maybe never had the opportunity to go to court so that's, that's a really amazing story. Thank you so much for sharing. Bianca. Yes. <laughs> um, so firstly, uh, my, posit- my first positive experience, I think it was when I just qualified and I got on my feet. And it was so daunting at the fact, oh my God, I've got to go to court. I've got to go to court um, and represent someone. And I think my first appearance was actually at Westminster Court. And when I walked into the courtroom, I remember sitting down and the legal advisor was black. Uh, There was two black female solicitors sat sat beside me. The prosecutor was also black. So I just thought, it made me me feel a bit comfortable. I didn't feel completely out of place and that I was somewhere alien. So, and it was quite empowering to know that there was other black females uh, like representing, you know, the the profession, et cetera. So that was a a quite empowering and positive experience. Um, Like Lady Jeannie as well, when I go to call, it's the same thing with uh, clients that are also black. It's that relatability that you have with them because they, they presume that you're from a similar background and to, to many of my clients that I do represent, I am from a similar background, so I can relate to them. And that is quite positive because at the same time, while you're defending them, um, you can empower them and, you know, give them encouragement and show them different routes uh, that they can go down to if they wanted to become a lawyer, you know. And like Letitia, you know, if someone is interested, you will go that extra mile just because they're black, but because they're the young people and they often don't get encouraged 
you know, you can encourage them or put them in contact with people. So, you know, gain work experience, et cetera, or just to see what the profession's about. And if they are interested, get, get some education as to how they enter the profession. Mm. Amazing. Thank you so much, Bianca. And Vaida, lastly. Um, I think my, I, I'll probably end up stealing everything that everyone said <laughs> because I've had <laughs> um, similar experiences. Um, and I think, so just dealing first, I, in terms of what Letitia said about giving back, I think for me that has been a, a very, very big deal because um, I grew up in Tottenham. Um, I don't know, I didn't know anyone that was a barrister. Um, even the thought of being a barrister was sort of alien to me. And I remember sort of there'll be days where my mum will, if I dress a certain way, my mum was like, you can't dress like that. That's not how barristers dress. Or, you know, that's not how, you know, you can't, you can't speak that way. You can't be loud. You can't be this. And so there was like this perception of what a barrister is. And that perception did not necessarily fit me or my personality. And because even now, sometimes I dress and people think I'm like an 18 year old, 19 year old person. Like, you know, jeans and trainers, I'm comfortable. And so I think sort of in terms of giving back, what's been really important for me, sort of speaking to young people in schools, um, speaking to sort of getting involved and volunteering because it's for them to see that this is what a barrister looks like. Yeah. You don't have to fit a particular mold. You don't have to sort of be a, a particular way to be a barrister. You can be yourself and do very well at your career as a result of that. So I think for me, that that is an experience that I really do you know that's one of my positive experiences and um, the other positive experiences is actually sort of being in court and I've had I think it's happened to me about two or three times now where I'm walking in court with my wig and gown on and then you know family members of people who I'm not even representing <laughs> yes. and, well done we're so proud of you <laughs> and it's sort of like this <laughs> and it literally changes things because you go from just let me get on with my case, the walking with your head up high, like, you know, I'm holding the whole community on my shoulders. <laughs> you know, look yeah. at this. And it's so people that you have, you've never met, you, you don't yeah. know, and it's happened yeah. so many times. Yeah. Um, and it's such an amazing feeling because I don't think other people get that feeling. And it's, it, it makes you realize the impact mm. of what you're actually doing. So it's not just the job. It, it, it's no longer just a job. It's like you actually just by you being there alone is making that difference. So that's been a really positive experience for me. And I think the last thing, which is Lady Jean and everyone's already touched on it, it's just about having clients actually relating to you very differently. And I think for me, a lot of the time, clients have told me certain things that they probably would never have told other counsel, um, which has then helped me to put their case as best as I can. Because mm -hmm. for example, some people might have personal family issues or they might have sort of things that they can disclose and I remember sort of as a third six pupil there was um I represented a client who was also sort of like a black woman and I went down into the cells had a conversation with her she told me you know all of these this really really personal stuff about her in terms of this is what she wants to come across I went into court told the court everything you know got her the result she wanted and interestingly enough she's never spoken to anyone like that before and I think because she felt comfortable with me enough, she was able to open up and express things that she probably would never have expressed to anyone else. And so for me, that is like another really positive experience that I've had. And it's something that you, you experience a bit more as you sort of represent more clients who unfortunately look like you. Mm. That's really interesting that you said that. And I think it just goes to show early on, like I said, how important representation is and not just that but being authentic to yourself because if you for example someone from Tottenham came into court and then you put on this accent that wasn't yours do you think that might change the way that some people relate to you do you think just because you are mm -hmm. able to just be yourself and um, that makes clients um, warm to you more than if you were somebody or trying to be somebody else I think if you try to be anyone else but yourself just working in general is difficult because mm -hmm. it, it, it will affect your confidence it will affect mm -hmm. you know you you sort of walk around feeling like an imposter because you know you are <laughs> being yeah. an imposter and so the way that you will present yourself would actually make things worse for you so I think you can only be yourself um, and it's really important to be yourself because that's what got you to where you are in the first place because a lot of times we hear that it's so difficult to be a black person in the profession and we as black women are 
doubly disadvantaged for the fact that we are black and the fact that we are women. But as you all have mentioned, you've all used it to your advantage and you've all mm -hmm. come up with really positive experiences to share with us tonight. So that's really, really heartening to hear. And I'm really glad. So thank you so much, all of you. And In terms I of positive experience, I'd say that the CPS West Midlands office, it's a great working environment because it is so diverse. But if I go to the first thing that comes into my head, it's, it's the community that I feel a part of. Like it's such a lovely feeling to feel part of a community. And in particular, I'm a committee member of Birmingham Black Lawyers, also known as BBL. And what we do is we organise events um, to promote diversity within the legal profession and the events are aimed at students and established legal professionals. We try to bring them together so that students can then get those valuable tips and be exposed to opportunities with these professionals that they just wouldn't have got otherwise. So it's about bridging that gap. And I think I really benefited from that myself, like going to BBL's events. I got to meet the Chief Crown Prosecutor for the West Midlands before I'd applied for my training contract. So I got my face out there, got my name out there. Um, and just going to events and experiencing that professional setting and getting comfortable with networking, it's just so important, really important skills that I've picked up. But I feel like what I'm trying to say is the positive experience is feeling supported by a community and... I'm really someone who, I, I don't like asking for help, but one bit, but being part of this community, being part of BBL, I haven't had to ask for help. The, the team have been there for me and at events, all our members are so approachable and supportive, it really feels like we're in it together and it's, it's lovely. And the last question that I'm going to ask is, what is one tip that you would tell your past self? Don't be discouraged, ever. Thank you. Short and sweet. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Letitia. Um, I I was thinking about this, and actually, there's quite a lot of things that I would tell my <laughs> younger self. Um, I think one of the things that has kind of been touched on by everyone in sort of an indirect way is about just the self belief, because this job does. Um, some, sometimes through whatever experiences you have in this job, you, some, you do feel like an imposter sometimes, whether that's because you go in a, a robing room and you're faced with like a lot of older white males who look at you like you shouldn't be there or like you're trying to have a conversation and, and it sometimes seems as though people may not take you as seriously as what they should be doing. Um, and it's good when you get a result in a case, like for example, you know, doing a trial where your opponents underestimated you because you may look younger than them or you 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 look very different to them, and then you win. Like that's a good feeling to me. Like that because you know you have to trust your instincts in this job. I think a lot. Um, you have to be authentic as Vida um, was saying, and I think one of the big things as well is don't be afraid to fail. Like, don't be afraid to put yourself out there and, and do things um, that, you know, you're not, like, it's not in your comfort zone. Go out there and do them and, you know, learn from your mistakes, learn from the lessons or learn from the things that you lose. So, yeah, there's a lot of things that I would tell my younger self. Um, but w the last thing I would say as well is just make sure that you, you know, you look after yourself as well because burnout is a real thing like we this job is not a nine to five like you, you literally work in day in day out and at ungodly hours so you have to pace yourself um because i've been doing this for some years now and it takes its toll so you have to know when know what your limits are and know when you need a rest and know when you know you can work and work but you know it's worth it the advice I would give to my younger self is to never doubt myself and to ne ever, never let anyone discourage me from f following my dreams. And that's the, the advice I would give to any young person who was thinking about entering a career in the legal profession. Thank you. Amazing. And lastly, Vida. Um, I think 
like Letitia, I have so much to say, <laughs> but I'm going to try and pick two. And the, the first one for me would be to celebrate the little wins, um, because I think it's such a long journey to get to where we're at at the moment that we sort of sometimes lose, lose ourselves in, you know, if, for example, you, you don't get through that interview or, you know, the fact is, well, you still got to that door, you at least made it to the interview. Mm. Um, you know, if you were select, you know, if you sort of got through to even past your exams, that, that is a little win. And I think sometimes we do lose ourselves in trying to get the ultimate goal that we don't celebrate the little wins and we discourage ourselves and feel that, well, we, we, we can't make it or we can't achieve because we've had those little failures along the way. Um, so it's just important to celebrate the little wins. Don't let, don't let the failures discourage you and to celebrate those. And the second thing is exactly what Bianca said. Don't, just don't be discouraged. Um, be, you know, just know that no matter what happens, you will get there. Just keep going. So that, those are the two key points for me. Yeah, earlier on today, I, I was one other thing that I would tell myself is find a mentor like it doesn't yes. always have to be somebody who is like where you want to be or higher than you in experience but it needs to be somebody who you're you can be accountable to so you say mm -hmm. I want to do this and they might not know exactly what to tell you but as long as you've got someone watching over you that can maybe give you an objective point of view I think that's also important most definitely, definitely. And have any of you had experience with mentoring? Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Really and I think it. just to add as well um, to what Letitia is saying, because sometimes people might find it difficult to find a mentor. Um, you don't, just because you don't have the people around you doesn't mean that you, you know, you can't randomly go on LinkedIn and ask people to be your mentors. Like, don't let that, dis the fact that you don't know anyone shouldn't let that dissuade you from actually going out and searching for your own mentors. Um, so if you have to be a, a, you know, a legal stalker, I'll say legal stalker <laughs> <laughs> on LinkedIn and, you know, find, finding someone to just emailing them saying, can you, can you be my mentor? Can you give me some advice? Don't let that stop you and don't be dissuaded from doing that. Definitely. I definitely agree with that, especially now that we're all at home and there's not going to be many opportunities for networking events over canapes, oh, I miss the canapes, as there were in the past. Like before I would go to these events and I'd meet people and, you know, build relationships with them and they could end up being my mentor. But now that that's not a possibility anymore, not being afraid to reach out to lawyers on LinkedIn, on Twitter, et cetera, et cetera, is definitely the way to go. So thank you for that advice, Spider. I would definitely, if I was younger, I'd definitely take that on board. <laughs> and, you know, I was thinking earlier on today what I would say to myself, and it was very different to all of yours, because you yours are all about, like, encouragement, motivation. I think the one piece of advice that I would tell my younger self is to not bother with all those back schemes at city law firms because you have no interest in becoming a solicitor, number one, and you know, have no interest in that sort of law that they're doing. And it's something that when I was at uni, everyone was like, oh, back scheme, back scheme. And so I was like, I've got to do this, even though I want to be a criminal barrister, I'm going to do this anyway. So to baby kit off in second year, first year, whatever, don't bother doing that. Focus on what it is that you know you want to do. And that's the one piece of advice I would give to my former self. So, in terms of advice that I would give to my younger self, <laughs> I would definitely tell myself to deal with my lack of confidence a lot sooner. Like, it's something that you have to address head on. It, it won't get better on its own. And I was, at one stage, really bad. I didn't want to be. I wanted to be confident. I knew that it was required of a solicitor to be confident. But I wasn't. My, I'd go bright red. I'd start sweating. My lip would wobble. My eyes would fill with fill with water, and I had to try so hard not to make them spill over. Inside, I would desperately be telling myself that I'm okay, but my body was not cooperating <laughs> at all, one bit. And it's because I would always avoid putting myself in any kind of situation where I would be made to feel uncomfortable. But to deal with the lack of confidence, you've got to put yourself out there. I heard people say that confidence was a skill that you could learn, you, it would, you'd gain it with experience, 
but I think the issue was is that I was just expecting it to come I thought it would just happen but I got further into my education and it did not just appear <laughs> so it didn't get better until I started to proactively address it you have to you have to believe in yourself you really really have to believe in yourself and put yourself in those awkward situations so you start to realise that you can deal with it and it's not as bad as you're building it up to be in your head but also recognising that it's okay if you feel a bit uncomfortable about it but when you start you know that it will be absolutely fine and I think if I'd have addressed that sooner it would have made going for opportunities so much easier because I would have believed in myself it's all about believing in yourself so, so thank you all it's been a lovely discussion um, I'm really glad that you were able to join us we at Wicked are very very grateful and everything you've said has been very very insightful and um, so yeah thank you all for coming and thank you everybody at home for watching we hope that you've enjoyed it and we do hope that you keep a lookout for further upcoming work that the Race Equality Committee are doing. We will be putting together very shortly a who's who booklet of practitioners in criminal law from black and ethnic minority backgrounds. So do keep a lookout on Wickle's channels that be in Twitter, LinkedIn and our emails to find out about how you can be involved in that. Again, thank you very much for watching and thank you for our, uh, to our lovely panellists for joining us. All right, well, have a good evening. You too. Thank you for having us. Hello, ladies. Bye. 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 Bye.